mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Every now and then you'll hear Christians talk about a believer or a former believer that left the faith and uh, is no longer coming back, and someone's going to suggest that maybe they blaspheme the Holy Spirit, uh, and they can't come back. They are unforgiven forever. So what is this, uh, this term, especially if it means that you have sinned in some way that's unforgivable and removes you from the grace of God? Is such a term even, or an idea even biblical? given that God's grace is supposed to be sufficient and forgiveness for sins is supposed to be all-encompassing? Well, let's look at what the, the Bible itself says about the matter. Now, we get this term from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, and where he says, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, given that that comes from the mouth of our Lord, it deserves some careful reflection, meditation, and investigation, especially given the severe consequences. After all, none of us want to accidentally commit this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and find ourselves removed from uh, heaven for eternity. So what is meant by this, this term and this verse? Well, to begin with, a good rule of thumb whenever reading Scripture is if you come across a verse, don't just read the verse. You need to read the context and all the verses around it. Especially, like in Matthew 12, 31, when that verse begins with the word, therefore. Therefore could also be translated, for this reason. And a good way to remember this is that when you see therefore in a Bible verse, go back and read the, chat, the verses before it to get the full thought, and then you'll know what it's there for. Easy memory tool. In Matthew 12, you want to go as far back as Matthew 20, 12, 22. And really, you should probably read all the way to verse 37 if you want to get the full thought of Jesus. We're going to stop probably around 12, 31. But still, if you're going to read this, you should go all the way to 37. Now, to get the context, in verse 22, we have this scene where Jesus heals a demon-possessed man in front of a crowd. Now, the crowd starts to murmur that he might be the Messiah, the coming son of David that they've all been waiting for. Now, the Pharisees, who are also in the crowd and also witness this, want to squelch any of that. So they start to say that he is only able to cast out demons through the power of Satan or the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So they're attributing what his, he's doing to Satan. Now, Jesus has a lot to say in response to this. Uh, Verses 25 through 37 contain his response. And first, the Lord just gives them a logical uh, response on why that would be inconsistent. He basically lays out that if Satan is going to cast out his own demons, then he's dividing his kingdom, and a divided kingdom cannot stand. It would be ridiculous of him to cast out his own demons and thwart his own purposes. So that makes no sense at all to accuse Jesus of casting out demons through the power of Satan. And then he affirms that the power he has does not come from Satan, but from the Spirit of God. Then he comes to this, this great passage about uh, it being impossible for a demon to inhabit him because he would have to bind the strong man or bind the Spirit of God and take possession of what was there, which is an impossibility. It's just kind of an assumed impossibility from the mouth of our Lord. And he's saying that if my power comes from the Spirit of God and not from Satan in verse 28, then that means the kingdom of God that you've been waiting for is being ushered in right now through me. And you have to deal with that. Because Jesus' authority cannot be ascribed to anyone other than God, he then draws this line that all of humanity is either for him or against him. You are either on his side or against his side. There is no fence sitting. There is no in-between. It's one or the other. And he's putting the Pharisees on the spot. You are either with me or you are not with me. And if you're not with me, you're against me, which would make you against God. Then we come to verse 31 and following. And this is where he says that all sin and blasphemy will be forgiven except for the blasphemy against the Spirit, which will be un remain unforgiven. Now, in the context of the passage, and the immediate context of Jesus' discussion with the Pharisees, what he is talking about is the attributing of the power of God or the actions of God through Christ to Satan. The, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that he is telling the Pharisees about is what they just did, to attribute the works of God to Satan. This is even more clear in a parallel account in Mark 3. Mark 3.30 ends this story with this line, 
after he gives them the blasphemy of the Spirit, it says, because they accused him of having an unclean spirit. So it lays it out there without really any doubt of what he's talking about. Now, this does bring up one other question, though. If this is specifically what the blasphemy against the Spirit is, is there any need to worry? Is it even possible for us to do such a thing today? Well, the Apostle John, in his first epistle, uh, 1 John, wrote of a sin that leads to death. Now, many people believe that he's referring to the blasphemy against the Spirit in Matthew and in Mark. He writes of a sin that leads unto death versus a sin versus sins that do not lead unto death. And that's in 1 John 5, 16 and 17. And so if we ask the question, can we commit this blasphemy against the Spirit today? And it seems that John is referring to the same thing. And John wrote his at the end of the first century. At least by then, they still felt it was possible. And this was long after Jesus and the Pharisees. So if it was possible for them then... It must be possible for us now. So what does that mean? Well, the entire context of 1 John is ultimately the forgiveness of God through Christ Jesus. Uh, it's, it's, it's that he forgives our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins and the sins of the whole world. And then it goes on to say what you must be like as a result of this. Not unlike Romans, he starts to talk about what the character of a believer would look like because of this forgiveness. Uh, he goes on and on to talk about living in the light, not sinning, not lying, loving your neighbor, loving God, all these things that would flow from a believer who has accepted this, this wonderful gift of forgiveness from sin. And then he ends by saying, there, but there's a sin that leads to death. Now, for John to, to spend an entire letter talking about forgiveness of sin and the characteristic of the forgiven... To come at the end and set, talk about a sin unto death would be almost the same as saying he's talking, he's talking about the character of someone who would commit this sin. In, because he's differentiating between a sin that does not lead to death versus a sin that does lead to death, he's revealing that there is two types of persons, two types of believer, two characteristics. I'm going to quote Robert Yarborough on this. He is a Johannine or a John scholar, and he is a, an eminent scholar and writer of commentaries and things like that. Uh, he says, The sin unto death is simply a violation of the fundamental terms of a relationship with God that Jesus Christ mediates. It is to have a heart unchanged by God's love in Christ, which is consistent with what John writes in his first letter. The universal usage of death in John's letter is spiritual death, not physical death. It is a sin that leads to spiritual death. It is a characteristic of an unchanged heart toward God. So therefore, if we combine what we learn from Matthew in the words of Christ with what we learn from John, the apostle, we find the answer to our question. What is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? It is the sin of those who, after having been exposed to the message of salvation and the forgiveness of Christ, having seen the power of his word, willfully remain in a state of rejection. There is no more miracle. There is no more evidence. There is no more explanation that will ever convince them because they have seen it. They have experienced it. It's been laid out for them. Yet they willfully and volitionally choose to reject it. Now, this is a grave sin, and it is a sin that leads to spiritual death. But this is not a sin that a Christian need worry that they can commit. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you're even worrying about committing it, you're demonstrating a convicted conscience and a softened heart, and the characteristic of someone who has sinned unto death is an unchanged, unrepentant, hardened heart. If you had committed it, you wouldn't care. Keep that in mind. Also, while this might be a sin committed by those who were once part of the professing church, that's the extent of it. They were part of the professing church, meaning all they were was professing Christ. They have not they did not possess Christ in the same manner that those in first in John's first epistle had. <clears throat> 
The seed of God's word had not yet penetrated the soil of their heart, to use Christ's analogy in his parable. So while the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is real, and it should be of deep concern, it is not what is commonly thought. It is not a sin that we might commit at any given point resulting in expulsion from grace, expulsion from forgiveness, and into eternal damnation. It is a consistent state of a hardened and unchanged heart toward God.